Welcome, everybody. Brother Dan Goodwin here. I'm your host today on the Prophecy News Program, and I'm glad to be here. I hope that you're doing well. We've got a important program today, and uh, I'm going to read you a scripture first in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says this, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. You know, there are some prophecies in the Bible that are very easy to see. Um, the many, many prophecies, of course, have already been fulfilled. They were, they were in the Old Testament. They pointed to Christ's first coming. Uh, but there are a lot of prophecies concerning the second coming of Christ as well. And many of them are quite plain. Uh, Israel getting back in their land, of course, a big prophecy. And it was quite, quite easy to understand. M.R. Dehan, way back in 1946, said that one day Israel will be back in their land. How did he know that? He, he knew prophecy. And, uh, but, you know, there's other prophecies <clears throat> that are not quite so easy to understand, are they? There are some prophecies that are uh, hard to see. Um, let, let me read another verse for you. <clears throat> Daniel goes on in the same chapter. <clears throat> in verse 6, uh, Daniel 12, chapter 12, verse 6, And he said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long sh uh, shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. Um, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, uh, all these things shall be finished. Now listen to what Daniel says. And I heard, but I understood not. Then, I, then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things. So Daniel asked for the interpretation of what the Lord just said here. And look what it says. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for thy words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. You know, there are some things in the Bible that God hasn't told us what they mean. Uh, Daniel was given a prophecy. And he, he even asked, Lord, what, what does this mean? And what was he told? He said, seal it up, Daniel. It's, it was, I didn't give this for you, your understanding. I gave this for a future generation to understand. Now, that is interesting. And then he goes on in verse 10 and 11 here uh, to, to give some more information. He says, uh, many shall be purified and made white and try, but the wicked shall do wickedly. Uh, verse 11, from the time of the daily sacrifice shall be taken away in the abomination that maketh desolate set up. There shall be three, uh, 2,290 days. He's talking about the middle of the tribulation there. But, but look what he says. The, thy word, the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. He said, Daniel, uh, this, this will not be understood by anybody until the time that it's needed to be understood. Let me read you a quote. In my Mystery of the Jubilee book on page 7, I want to read you a quote by a man named C.I. Schofield. Many of you out there have a, have, uh, possibly have a Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible. That, that's who I've got here. Back in 1906, Mr. C.I. Schofield, in, his book, uh, in the book of Revelation, at the end of his Bible, you know how they'll put a paragraph and they'll explain some things in the notes. Uh, Mr. Schofield made a statement that's profound. Listen to what he said about the book of Revelation. He said, doubtless, much which is designed, designedly obscure to us will be clear to those for whom it was written as the time approaches. Now that's profound. What Schofield is saying here is that I don't understand some of this. But at the time, the, the, when it's near the end, there'll be people, there'll be men who will understand because it was written for their understanding and not for our understanding. Now, Schofield was very humble here. He admitted he didn't know it all. And he admitted that the people in the end time, right before the Lord comes back, are going to understand things that he didn't understand. Now, very humble thing to say, isn't it? And by the way, we could all use some of that humility, couldn't we? We could all use some of that, that spirit in us that says, look, I'm just a, I'm just a man. Uh, we've all got some preconceived notions in us. We've all been taught things all of our life that maybe aren't quite right. And we struggle to understand. We struggle to change our mind on some things sometimes. Uh, that's human, right? But, it, but realize, none of us has it all. None of us. Um, so, let me, let me say this. <clears throat> there are two great signs of the end times, I believe. 
The two greatest end time signs, number one, is Israel. Israel getting back in their land. Israel getting Jerusalem. We did a show on that recently. Uh, Israel is the greatest end time sign of all end time signs. And the fig tree budding, I believe the fig tree took root in 1948. I believe the fig tree budded in 1967. And I believe we're in that final generation and it's winding down. Um, so Israel, huge, huge, huge prophetic, uh, prophetic event, prophetic thing. And by the way, a lot going on there even now with uh, the possible peace agreement coming, this possible uh, with the son-in-law of Mr. Trump, by the way, uh, the, the president of the United States making Jerusalem, acknowledging it as the capital, moving the embassy. That, that's huge. That is huge. And listen, it's all coming together over there in Israel. Uh, but the second greatest end time sign may, may surprise some of you. And I talk about this in my Seven Clocks a Ticking book. I, talk, I have a whole chapter called Israel is a tip, Ticking Clock. And I have a chapter in there called The Church is a Ticking Clock. I believe the church is the second greatest sign of all end time signs. Uh, I'm talking about the, the fact that the, the, the church in the book of Revelation, the seven churches, Revelation 2 and 3, uh, that seventh church is called the church of the Laodiceans. And I believe that the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 are a prophetic picture of what? The entire 2,000-year church age. And it uh, starts with the apostolic age in uh, Revelation chapter 2, uh, the church of Ephesus. That's the church that existed at the time of the apostles. And uh, Paul's going to come along and be the, the, the apostle born out of due time. Uh, and, then, uh, and then as you go through the seven churches, the sixth church is the Philadelphia age church. I believe that that pictures the years 1700 to 1900. And then the last church, the Laodiceans, I believe that church represents the final church age from 1901 to the rapture. We're in that final age right now. In fact, we're at the end of that age. I believe, there's, uh, I believe that that's a huge prophetic sign, second only to the nation of Israel. Okay? So with that being said, is there a prophecy about the end time church? Is there a prophecy about the end time church that we've all missed? Is there a prophecy in the Bible that is blaring at us today that's been, that has been sealed for 2,000 years and now is understandable to us today? I believe there is. Uh, is there a prophecy about the King James Bible issue? Is it possible that there's a prophecy in the Bible? Now, now stay with me here. Is it possible that the Lord had something to say about this book that I'm holding in my hands, which happens to be the 1611 King James Bible? Uh, now, we're, we're, we, we use the King James here on Prophecy News. You know that. J.R. Church, way back in 1979, started this ministry. One of the things that drew me to J.R. Church several years back, uh, and I had never met him in person, I'm going to meet him pretty soon. When that trumpet sounds, we're going to have a time up there, but I've never met uh, J.R., I feel like I know him just from, you know, studying about him and, and seeing some of the interviews he did here in this wonderful studio that I'm privileged to be sitting in today. Um, one of the things that drew me to, to J.R. Church was his love for the King James Bible. Now, listen, we, we don't beat people up over it. We're not, we don't get mad at people. We have guests sometimes that sit here, and they're not necessarily King James like, like we are and, and like I am, uh, but there are good men out there who do not... Uh, see things the way we do maybe use a different bible different bible version and look i'm not i'm not i'm not on a crusade against anybody but is it possible that the king james bible is mentioned in scripture as a prophecy of the end times i believe i'm gonna i believe i'm gonna shock you t uh, today with some things that i'm gonna say um what does Gen genesis 3 and revelation 2 and 3 share in common and I'll read you that in a minute. I got a new book here that I want to tell you about. It's called the KJB, the gold standard of the Word of God. Somebody asked me, this is comic, somebody asked me, Brother Gunner, what, what's the KJB? <laughs> what's the KJB, they said. And I said, it's, it's Russian collusions. The KJB, it, this is a book about Russian collusion. No, my friend, the, the KJB is simply, uh, many of you would call it the KJV, King James Version. 
I happen to like the, the KJB uh, better, the King James Bible. So when I talk about the KJB, I'm not talking about Russian collusion, okay? <laughs> I'm talking about this book right here, the King James Bible. I think it's important that we talk about this a little bit. Um, in these last days that we're living in, would you admit this? Would you admit that there's a lot of confusion today over where the Word of God is? Where's the Bible? Which Bible should I use? Is, is, uh, by the way, that, that's a personal choice that you're going to have to make. I can't make that for you. I'm gonna, in a moment, I'm going to show you the journey that I took and why I uh, am a King James man. But, uh, um, but it's a journey that you're going to have to figure out uh, on your own. Now, maybe something we say here today will be a help to you. But the KJB, the gold standard of the Word of God in these last days. This is a prophecy book. And I'm telling you, when I, when I stumbled on this, and, uh, and I stumbled on this some time uh, ago, but, but God kind of illuminated. When I wrote the Seven Clocks of Ticking book, I mentioned some of this. I've got a chapter. Uh, in fact, I put that chapter in this book uh, from the Seven Clocks of Ticking book uh, because there was, there was a part of that chapter that was, that was what this is about. And that it shed light on this, this prophecy that we're going to talk about today. And I don't know how many people have emailed me after reading the chapter in the Seven Clocks Ticking Book. The, the chapter called The Church is a Ticking Clock. I, I don't know how many emails I've got, phone calls, uh, messages, Facebook. People wanting to know more. I said, Brother Gurr, that was so interesting. I, I, I don't understand this issue. Could, could you share some more of that? Well, here it is. <laughs> Here it is. Thank you for asking. Here it is. Um, now, this book may not be for everybody. If, if you're out there and, and if you don't like the King James Bible, you, you've, you feel like you've studied the issue, you don't want nothing to do with it, this, this probably isn't a book for you. I, I wouldn't call and, and order it. Uh, but you know what? Listen, listen to the program today. You might, you might glean something that will help you in your understanding of this important issue. So, the new book. Oh, let me read for you the back cover. Um, the back cover says this, the world ends right where it began 2,000 years ago. And I have in the book, I have a picture, and I don't know, uh, we'll see if Rex can put a picture up there for you. Uh, my sister sketched this for me. It's a picture of Eve sitting, uh, standing in front of the tree with the fruit on it, and the serpent is there. Um, question and getting her to question the word of god had god said so um the world ends right where it began six thousand years ago with a bride liberating fruit and a serpent the battle has always been over the bible man began his days nearly six thousand years ago questioning the word of god it appears that he will end his days with the same confusion questioning where's the bible had god said is there a prophecy in the scriptures that points to the king james bible <laughs> is the battle over bible versions a part of the end times that is talked about in the book of revelation are you curious to know how this all ends go back to the beginning you know remember isaiah 46 10 he telleth the end from the beginning. You want to know how it ends? Go back to Genesis 1. <laughs> what do we see in Genesis 1 or Genesis 3, actually? You see what I just described. You see the serpent getting the bride, which represents the bride of Christ. Who's the bride today? The bride of Christ. Eve is Adam's bride. You and I are the Lord Jesus Christ's bride, or the bride-to-be, I should say. We're the espoused bride. And uh, what have we got today? We have got the serpent we have got liberalism. We have got evil. We've got people trying to get us to question the Word of God. Is there such a thing as a perfect Word of God today? Um, it all ends just like it began 6,000 years ago. Do you believe that, my friends? Do you believe that that's possible, that we're going to end just like we began? I've been saying that for years. I've been telling people in all my prophecy books, we're going to end like we began. You, you want to know how it ends? Go back to the first book of the Bible. You can see it all unfolds there. In fact, uh, how many days of creation are there? Six. And then the seventh day, God rested. Those six days are what? Prophetic of 6,000 years of human history. The seventh day where God rested, the Sabbath rest, is the kingdom age, the millennium. You, go back, you want to know about the end? You want how long we're going to be here? It's right there in Genesis 1, the six days of creation. We're going to be here 6,000 years, and then we're going to have the final 1,000-year kingdom age. 
Now, some of you are saying, uh, Brother Goodwin, this is, uh, this, is the, this is the year 2019, Brother Goodwin. Uh, we've already missed it. No, this is not 2019. The calendar's not right. For one thing, we started the calendar at the death of uh, We started the calendar at the birth of Christ. The New Testament didn't start at the birth of Christ. It started it after the, after, after the cross. Uh, so the calendars are all messed up. Pay no attention to the calendar. Pay no attention to the Hebrew calendar either. Uh, I think they're in the year 5779 or something like that. Uh, they messed with the calendar a long time ago. They, they removed over 200 years from the Hebrew calendar. Pay no attention to either one of them. Um, so, so the back cover, interesting here. Um, um, the book unveils the hidden end times prophecy. Uh, it also examines the history of the King James Bible. talks about the translators. And we'll talk about that in the show either today or next week. Um, it talks about the, the printing process in 1611, why there were printer errors, not translation errors, printer errors that had to be corrected later. Um, um, it explains biblical inspiration. I explain what inspiration is very simply. I ex oh, by the way, the word inspiration is only two times in the Bible, and I explain what the word inspiration means. Listen, it is not the writer of the Bible that was inspired. This is where some of the confusion. God didn't inspire Paul. God, it wasn't Jeremiah that was inspired. It's the words that are inspired. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth. Thou shalt keep them from this generation forever. Uh, it's the words that are given in, that are inspired or have life. And uh, listen, if the Bible's not alive, it can't make you alive. The Bible says we're quickened. Ye who are quickened. What does that mean? You're made alive. How are we made alive? By the word of God. If the word of God's not alive, it won't quicken you. <laughs> uh, so these issues are pretty important, wouldn't you say? I talk about inspiration. I explain what it is. I give the first mention of inspiration. Uh, Job 32.8, of all places, uh, gives the very definition of the word inspiration. So I talk about inspiration. I talk about divine preservation. What good is inspiration if God can't preserve it for all generations? <laughs> uh, so uh, God has preserved his words. Um, I'll shock you with the truth about the originals. The originals. You know, we hear a lot about originals today. Do you know there's no originals anywhere on planet Earth? What do we mean when we say originals? We mean this. Originals are the handwritten documents or manuscripts the handwritten scriptures written by the Apostle Paul, Peter, John, or in the Old Testament, Jeremiah, Moses, Isaiah, Daniel, you know, all through the Ezra, Nehemiah. The originals would be the handwritten with, with, a, with a, 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 a feather quill ink pen or something written on either lambskins or papyra, uh, written by the original writer like Paul or Peter. That's what's meant by the original. Did you know, my friend, there are no originals on planet Earth today? Let me, let me, say, let me be a little stronger with that. In, my, in one of my books, in fact, in this book, I mention, I double-dog anybody to prove me wrong about that. Uh, go ahead, prove me wrong. What you're going to find when you do a little bit of study, and I've studied this issue well over a thousand hours. I don't even know how many hours I've studied. I've meditated and mused and studied and, and worked and... Uh, for years of study on this issue. And uh, what well, you're going to find after five minutes of Googling it, you're going to find there are no original manuscripts on planet Earth. None. None. Now, are you listening? Did, did, did somebody sit up in your seat out there in TV land or on your computer today? Did somebody suddenly sit up and say, what? Because we've been taught all of our life some, a preacher will get up in his pulpit, he'll open his Bible, and he's got his congregation out there, and he'll read a verse, and he'll say, oh, now, now that word there, in the originals, actually means, and he, and he begins to expound upon what that word means in the originals. What you ought to do is raise your hand or, or go time out, uh, 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 preacher, uh, uh, hold it, hold it, preacher. Uh, I want to see, uh, where are these originals you're talking about? And he's going to stutter around for a minute. And I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just being facetious here. Uh, but uh, you ought to want to do it. Ask him after the service. Uh, Pastor, what, uh, you, you mentioned the originals that, you, uh, that this word is in that you found. Could you tell me where to find those originals so I can see for myself? 
Uh, what you're going to find is that preacher probably doesn't even realize that what he said is not accurate. There are no originals. You can't go to an original handwritten document written by Paul and look up that Greek word in there that Paul wrote and, and, and see, oh, that word actually is this. Uh, I guess the translators got that a little bit wrong there. My friend, if the translators got it wrong there, we may as well all close our Bibles and go home and go golfing because nobody has the Word of God. Um, if God didn't preserve His words, and by the way, nowhere did God ever, <clears throat> nowhere did God ever promise to preserve the originals. If you can find anywhere in the Bible where God promised to preserve the originals, call me. I, wa I want to know where you find that because He didn't promise that and He didn't do that. Um, I'll go a step further. There were no, not only there were no originals today, there were no originals in, in, in the translator's day in 16, 1607 when they did their translating. There were no original uh, Greek manuscripts or Hebrew manuscripts in those rooms in London when they did their work. Um, none. And let me go a little further than that. Uh, by the way, are you, are you surprised about that? I explain this in the book. I explain about the Greek and the Hebrew and the fact that uh, there, there was no preserved Greek. There was no perfect Greek. Uh, that's why we have italicized words in the Bible, because there were man Greek manuscripts that didn't have some of these words. Now, that the translators knew they belonged there. How did they know? Because they had all these Bibles. They had the Bishop's Bible. They had the Geneva Bible. They had the, the, the Tyndale Bible. Uh, they, they, had, they had the Spanish Valera. They had, all, they had Greek manuscripts. They had all this stuff in the room at their, their, their disposal. Um, and, uh, and they used those. And so they looked at all the Bibles and they knew what belonged where. And, and they gave us the wonderful, preserved, perfect King James Bible. So let me stop right here for a second. Um, go to the screen if, if you're interested in this book. It's, and, it's somewhere between 124, 130 pages. Easy reading. Uh, it'll help you. It will help you with the issue of the Word of God. It'll help you understand inspiration. It'll help you understand preservation. It'll help you understand who the translators were in, in 1607 and uh, who they were, what kind of men they were, what they did. It'll help you understand the process of translating, printing. Um, but it'll, under, it'll, un, it'll help you understand the miracle of the King James Bible. Go to, on your screen, there should be a website there, crossingnews.com, and a phone number during business hours. You can either call and order the book, or you can uh, go to the website and order it there. Uh, I really think you'll enjoy this book. I really think it'll help you. And you're going to discover the hidden prophecy that we're going to get to in the next phase here. I'm going to explain to you the hidden prophecy that I found about the King James Bible in, the, in our Bible uh, that we use today. And uh, so... Uh, my journey, let me share with you my journey here in the few minutes we have left. My journey, how I became a King James man. I'm going to read you uh, right out of the book here, page, page 7. Let me help you with this. My journey to the gold standard, as I call it, the King James Bible. I made my decision in 1981, uh, a few months after I got saved. By the way, I got saved in the state of Maine. I was on leave in the U.S. Navy. And my sisters had left some reading material. In fact, I'll tell you what I read. I read Alberto by Chick Publications. It was a comic book. My sisters had stashed them in my room when I came home on leave because they wanted me to get saved. And I read through that, and, man, I got under conviction. And uh, uh, I rushed over to the window, got on my knees, and trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've been saved ever since. Never doubted one time. I placed my faith in Jesus Christ that day. 1981, by the way, July 4th, 1981, about 10 o'clock at night. I can still see the room in my mind. And I can, I can remember I realized for the first time that my, my church wasn't going to get me to heaven. Religion couldn't save me. I had been lied to. And uh, my good works weren't good enough. And I, I realized that moment Jesus had paid my sin debt. And I needed Jesus to be saved. And I got on my knees. I was saved before I got on my knees, but I didn't know it. I, 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 I simply, the best way I knew how, I, I put my faith in Jesus and thanked Him for dying on the cross for me. What a wonderful thing. Um, so that's where my journey began. I did not understand the things that are in this book when I got saved. And uh, I was a brand new Christian. I was 21 years of age. In the last year of my naval enlistment, I got born again. I returned to the ship with a, a living Bible translation in my sea bag. 
a living Bible. I still remember it. It had a green kind of a hardback cover or almost a hardback cover. Um, um, I remember the gold lettering on it, the living Bible. Uh, it was the first Bible. I was very thankful for that Bible. By the way, I'm still thankful for that living Bible. God used that in my life for a brief time. And boy, I'm thankful about that. Um, but then a few weeks later, or maybe a few months later, I don't remember, my sister, and she'll want me to mention her name on TV, my sister, Julie Brown, uh, me, uh, sent me a King James leather-bound Bible in the mail out to the ship. I was on the USS Savannah. I'll never forget. And by the way, she didn't know the issue about, about versions. She, she, my sister didn't know any of this any more than I did. But she sent me this leather-bound King James Bible. And, uh, uh, and I, I remember opening that up. I remember I began to read it. And I'll never forget what it was like for the first time to read the words of the King James Bible. And I never opened the other one again. I used the King, I've been a King James man ever since. I kind of felt like David of old when he, when he went to the priest. Remember when he said, is there a sword here? Remember the priest said, there's none here except the sword of Goliath. Remember what David said? He said, there's none like that one. Give it me. And that's the way I feel about my King James Bible. I think there's none like that one. Uh, is there good stuff in the, in, the, in, the, in the living Bible? Sure there is. I used it for a while, and many people preach. I'm not, I'm not bashing people for using other versions. I'm just saying, when I got into this one, my heart told me there's none like this one, and I began using this. So we're just about out of time. But listen, uh, the story of Genesis 3, everything ends like it began. It began with, with confusion. And the devil getting us to get our eyes off the Word of God and, and questioning the Word of God. I believe that happens in the end time. I believe in Revelation chapter 3, I believe I can read for you uh, exactly what's going on today. And uh, let me get to that here real quick. I think I got them here. I'll read them for you right here. In Revelation chapter 3, uh, it says uh, in verse 16, in verse 17, So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither caught nor ho cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. This is the Lord speaking to the last church, the Laodicean age that we're living in right now. Now look what he says to them. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. What is he talking about? I think the Lord is saying, you've lost hold of the word of God. I counsel thee, buy of me gold. Buy of me the gold tried in the fire, the word of God, that thou mayest be rich. I believe the end time church loses the word of God and uh, falls, uh, loses their understanding of where it is and, and, and gets into the confusion of the, uh, the hundreds of Bible versions that are out there today. Uh, they all say little different things. Can they all be right? Listen, we're going to pick up right here next time, so uh, don't miss. I'm going to explain to you what the last generation believed was the Word of God, and I'll help you. Uh, but until then, let's keep looking up.